for every problem you ever had, the solution to that problem always coexists with the problem. And you just need uh -huh. an expansion of your horizon to discover the solution that was always there because you know that solution always coexists um, with the problem and so that's the other reason why we look people you know with uh, diversity you know i think it's a very uh, it's such a fashionable term that i almost um, i'm hesitant to to use it but um, yeah. you know what, what does it really mean i mean we had people that uh, basically studied uh, brewery engineering and the right software for brain surgery you know we have people that are you know have an education as a tailor and they do maybe marketing so you know i think people from different parts of the world with different backgrounds different skill sets different views is really what is uh, you know absolutely crucial to discover the solution that's always there. And it also means that it's crucial to um, expose everybody in the company to the problem. Five years after you, you, you graduate high school, you go on this wild journey. You sell a book, you know, you get $75,000, which is a lot of money back then. Your parents allow you to pursue this idea in their basement. You've run out of money. It didn't work out. Everything says like, hey, you know what? This is great, Stefan, but you should probably go back to school. Why? Why didn't you do that? Because I just hated university. You know, I think it wasn't the right thing for me. It was like, you know, structured and, you know, I've already gotten used to basically making my own money. And then, you know, I just, you know, it wasn't the right thing for me. And then also at the, uh, you know, I've been through some other interesting um, basic episodes too, because basically it wasn't so completely easy to also, um, you know, just uh, work out the fight with the University of Vienna because I really just learned from them, you know, what CT and MRI images are. You know, I delivered my project, which was a data preprocessor, you know, and uh, after that, um, they basically started to claim ownership rights for what I did. And so they basically, you know, I got a letter from the Austrian government, basically more or less threatening me to, um, to, to, to sue me and taking me to courts. Yeah. So it's an organization um, under the, you know, Ministry of, uh, of Science. And so basically the Austrian government basically more or less sent me a, you know, basically cease and desist letter and basically, you know, more or less, uh, you know, uh, were, you know, was getting ready to take me to court. And, uh, you know, it was already even to the point where the court hearings, uh, you know, were, were scheduled. And how, uh, how old were you, by the way? 20. So how, it's also how, an how are your parents handling this just at the time? I, I didn't I tell them. I didn't tell them. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> That's that's why you're able to manage it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so how did how I, did that thought... feel coming home? Your parents like like oh Stefan, how's how's your day? It's like oh it's good, and then you back your mind. You're like I have the Austrian government sending me a cease and desist, but other than that, everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that I like skiing. I you know enjoy going to Austria, but maybe I just have to go and ski in Switzerland uh, moving forward, and uh, you know which was of course a bit of a naive uh, you know view. But um, I was convinced that I was right. And I think that being right, you know, I would also prevail. And so I think the, you know, legal fees are probably not as expensive, you know, here. I actually didn't have, I never even took a lawyer at that point. And, uh, but, you know, I think that, you know, it was just uh, more or less a bluff on their part. And uh, I think they um, more or less, uh, you know, backed out, uh, you know, just three days before the first court hearing. And um, basically that uh, didn't really you know, result in a very cozy relationship with uh, basically the University of Vienna. And it basically almost like took um, 20 years to kind of just recover and uh, basically get back to that. But, you know, back to your question, I mean, so there was another thing that uh, that I had basically more or less uh, um, gotten at that point. And my attitude was always that, you know, with all those experiences, this is something that nobody could take away from me. Something that basically, you know, you couldn't pay, you know, with money and it's an experience that, you know, how can you, you know, ever even, um, you know, just get something similar in just a few years with any other effort. So for that reason, it's always worthwhile to try to start your own business, uh, you know, basically no matter what. So basically it was in fact a really stupid idea to write software for uh, brain surgery because a neurosurgeon that needed software wasn't a good neurosurgeon 30 years ago. Fortunately for Brain Lab, you know, times have changed. And in fact, you know, also there weren't really any computers at that time. 
So um, Windows uh, 3.1 came out uh, basically just a few years later, the Pentium chip, etc. So the first computer that I used was in fact a Commodore Amiga, which was basically considered a gaming console. So which of course, you know, people didn't think that that would look too serious. So I basically um, took the front panel, I unscrewed the front panel and basically had a local machine shop and machine another different looking front panel out of solid aluminum so it looked really super high in fact it was much nicer than um the um yeah that would Amiga. make it look really nice i know i know which yeah. i know which model you're talking about that would make it actually look really nice to be honest yeah, because it was brownish and we gave it a different yeah, it looked color. really so ugly in fact, it looked very much it looked almost like very similar to how later on you know some of the um uh, the apple um you know computers looked like and uh, so then, uh, you know, the problem was also that I want to make sure that if people opened the motherboard that it didn't like, you know, it was an Amiga all over. So I basically put stickers on every chip and, uh, you know, the motherboard, etc. So then this was the um, basic brain scan workstation. And, uh, you know, so however, you know, I pretty much had run out of money, you know, in uh, 1992, I had, uh, you know, formidable competitor that just received FDA clearance. The FDA just imposed new guidelines on uh, software control devices in October of, uh, I think, 1991. And uh, basically, I had no customers. They sold like immediately the product to 10 clients and I had just like hardly any money and nothing. So what did I do? I built an exhibit booth in my parents' house garage. Um, I, um, you know, at that time I didn't have much material. So that's where, you know, the focus on light um, originated. Um, I, you know, checked about 850 pounds of luggage on a flight to the US. Well, you know, the building I'm in right now still was the airport. Um, I told the airline that I'm a student and this is my thesis work to basically talk myself out of paying for um, excess luggage. I love and, this. <laughs> and, and and this was basically in, uh, you know, the uh, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons in Washington, D.C. So That's a great basically, it's a great yeah, Congress. So, so we, we basically, uh, you know, couldn't afford to uh, stay in the city. We stayed at a Motel 6 in, uh, you know, Laurel, Maryland for um, at that time it was $18.95. We had uh, basically breakfast at, I believe, Shoney's for $3.49, which was so bad we didn't need to eat anything for the rest of the day. And uh, then basically um, we had a car that we, ser we served through Avis and we had made a booking with uh, free miles, but for some reason they couldn't find the right uh, you know, reservation key. So, you know, we disconnected the wire of the meter to basically get ourselves the free mileage. And uh, basically also, you know, we were supposed to set up the exhibit booth and pay for union labor, which we also couldn't afford at the time because it was $69 an hour. So basically we were waited, uh, we were waiting in the restroom um, basically until they locked up the exhibit hall for the night. And then we set up the exhibit um, booth, uh, you know, ourselves in the dark. And, uh, you know, I, I took my, you know, my sister along with me because I said, well, you need to be more bodies, uh, you know, just on the exhibit um, floor. And uh, basically when the exhibit opened, we were there with a flashy booth like most of our competitors. And as a result of that, we got the first um, sales, not as you may think, um, basic customers in Germany, but in uh, basically North America, in uh, Taiwan, in uh, basically South Africa. So BrainLab immediately was a global company for a market that really didn't exist in the niche of a niche. But, uh, you know, eventually today, fortunately, you're not a good neurosurgeon if you um, don't use software for, uh, you know, most procedures. In fact, you could almost like say you're not a good neurosurgeon if you don't use software from BrainLab nowadays. That is unbelievable. And I got I just got to recap that back because I love these are the kind of stories. This is why I started the show, by the way, is to hear stories like that, which is essentially like you took a huge bet on yourself and you believed you had unwavering belief. And then more the most important part that especially for the people who are product and marketers listening is that you went and launched a non-existent category in a market that didn't exist, which is the right yeah. thing when it comes to innovation. I think a lot of times too much, especially in the startup world, we think about disruption. When you disrupt, you're essentially dealing with the same mark, the same pieces, but true innovation means you leave all of that and you go to a completely blue ocean, right? Where you have no idea what's out there. And then you launch something and then there's gonna be a few of those 
you know, true believers or early adopters. Who are some of those early, I guess, early adopters and really true believers of Brain Lab in the early days that really helped make the company who it is today? So I think it was uh, maybe the first sales were like really, you know, partial. So there was basically, you know, just a, a neurosurgeon at uh, Morton Plant Hospital in Clearwater, Florida, you know, basically. Um, you know, we sold maybe the first really, you know, complete system um, at, uh, you know, to, uh, to Albany Medical Center. So, you know, they wanted to really, it was a complex radio surgery system for uh, using focused radiation in, uh, in, in uh, you know, for treatment of brain tumors. And uh, basically at that time, we really were quite successful with the um, help of the, um, um, you know, administrator to almost convince them. And then basically more or less the competition at that time, still radionics um, came back and basically says, um, Brain Lab doesn't have a target position, which was like one component um, that uh, basically, you know, they were right, we didn't have one. And I say, what an insult, you know, to basically say we don't have a target position. Of course, we have, you know, basically advice that can help you to, you know, correctly position the patient. And I say, well, you know, I think that I'm sure that you can um, maybe send us a picture of that. And say, uh, yeah, I'll send like you know, I just let, let me get a good picture, and like I'll send you something tomorrow. And I say, okay, crap, like how, um, you know, I have I had no idea what to send because advice didn't exist. So basically, I took my Commodore Amiga and basically, said, okay, I'm going to do a 3D rendering with one of the most sophisticated ray tracing, uh, you know, software programs, and I basically have. Um, more or less now time to think about how would I solve the problem of positioning a patient. And so far, it was very similar to the sextant system, like you had a set of scales, etc. And, you know, but basically it was for me too complicated to basically build a 3D object that had all those little scales because I would sit there for, you know, days and days and days. But, you know, I pretty much thought that I have about maybe 13 hours to basically build the object and then it needs about eight hours to, you know, render the image and then need to fax uh, you know the the picture that was at the time of faxes there wasn't really email and um so i i, I sat down and so okay i'm going to take a box a plexiglass box and i'm going to print um the sheets that have the exact coordinates which of course would be much safer because i then established a um, a reference uh, grid on the on those boxes and i print them i can actually print the exact position of the tumor so that you have some visual control and i will show the entry beam of the of the of the of the um of the radiation beam where the uh, treatment is starting so that is a complete independent redundant check that the entire setup is correct because it checks almost like five things at, the, at, at, at once and that basically there were no other errors along the way and I basically sat all night uh, to uh, basically render that. I went to bed at five o'clock in the morning, started the computer to uh, render the image with it at that time took you know six seven hours and in the morning I basically took a look at the 3D rendered picture. I printed it with a dot matrix printer and I faxed it and customer was delighted say what a cool concept you know why didn't you show us that in the first place and i built the device and shipped it within six weeks and that became almost like the benchmark for the market and uh, three years later you know radionics adopted exactly and copied exactly you know what we had um you know created so basically you know i've, I've been really you know quite uh, um inventive uh, you know at that uh, at that early time but um, basically then, of course, when you want to grow the business, um, basically, you know, this all, you know, continues to cost money. So, you know, I think, as you noted you know, earlier, the money from the book eventually was gone. So every time I wanted to spend something, I calculated, OK, how much money do I need? And then I basically, you know, looked at, OK, which customer is going to pay me that exact amount? And I went to this customer really, as I said, with this mindset, this I'm going to sell him this product and he doesn't know yet, but, you know, he will buy my product. And, you know, mostly, you know, they did. And uh, however, you know, I think hospitals are late to pay very often. So when the company was basically getting to about, let's say, um, uh, you know, five million dollars of uh, business, you know, we also had probably five million dollars uh, of accounts receivable. And uh, yeah, 
uh, this was also before venture capital was even available. I didn't even know the term. And basically also in Germany, there isn't such a thing like, you know, personal bankruptcy that you could file. So basically, you know, if something goes wrong, you're going to pay for the rest of your life. Um, basically, you're going to be enslaved by the bank. So, um, and it's actually not even so easy to get a loan for, you know, 5 million with basically nothing. So basically, I went to the local savings bank and I, you know, basically I've been able to convince the banker to just give me a loan. And I personally guaranteed, you know, I think it was going up to, you know, basically 80 times my, you know, as the um, business grew, I had to also the guarantees went up to 80 times, a zero times my annual net salary, which, of course, you know, I think once it goes be, be beyond uh, 10 or 20, you know, it kind of just really doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. So basically nobody's going to work, work um, you know, I think at that time I would have needed to work until I'm, you know, 103 or so years old, which is like very unlikely. And even with advances of te um, in technology and, uh, you know, but I was really fearless. You know, today I would say stupid, but, you know, I felt fearless. And, you know, of course, another thing I didn't tell my parents. <laughs> just on this is you know i knew that i was gonna have a great conversation with you today but had had i known it would be anything like this i probably wouldn't have slept last night actually i didn't sleep last night much because i was i was pretty excited because i'm like because again the biggest thing is like this guy's been in his own company for over 30 years now He's, he doesn't know anything else i was like there's gonna be some interesting stories i didn't think it'd be like this though that is unbelievable and you know it kind of it kind of explains your um your philosophy when it comes to hiring which is you know it's it's not like an aging it's more of like you want to hire people with very interesting diverse backgrounds but more importantly the there's this lack of experience that that allows you to have not no gauge on your limit and you go beyond it and it's kind of yes. sounds like that's that's why a lot of this like had you tried to do brain lab later on in life it probably wouldn't have happened because you you would have had you'd have had all these biases already built up in your head you know and these limitations yep. of perception and imagination and i think back then because of your uh, really your imagination, and I think the fact that that there's a there's this concept of imagination where you can manifest things into reality as so as long as you're able to really like deeply experience it in your on your own body and your imagination. And it sounds like from the conception of your products to selling of the customers, it's like you already saw these things happening before they happened. And so for you to take action and maybe fail, but try again, like that, that was just part of, it's almost like a plane taking off from one point A to point B. You're going to get to point B, even if there's some turbulence. Do you feel like that was a big part of it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I think it's mostly really the privilege of uh, being surrounded by the people that I've just, uh, um, you know, hired for, for, for brain lab. So, um, you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs hire people that are maybe a little minimis of themselves. Yeah, maybe that's true. genetic clones with a small genetic defect, so they can't quite, you know, get up to the level of uh, basically their boss. And, uh, you know, this uh, really, uh, you know, incredibly smart group of people was really, you know, what's driving the success. So I'm personally not really responsible and can't take credit for like, you know, all those, uh, you know, cool things we do. I'm trying to more or less become maybe the sounding board and, you know, more or less stimulate maybe a new thought or direction here and there. Um, you know, for example, you know, we have something that we call, you know, our bus system. The first name of the first generation was Digital Lightbox. It's a big touch display that I felt, you know, we want to have a really interactive gateway for surgeons to manipulate and work with data. And the way of how we came up with that was I saw the movie Minority Report, where Tom Cruise manipulates, uh, you know, crime in the future. And I thought, this is what we want for uh, for surgery. So I uh, gave a DVD to one of my best project managers. I said, okay, here's a you know budget of a million dollars. You have 18 months. That's uh, what I want you to develop. And uh, basically, we launched, uh, you know, the digital light box um, in, um, you know, early... Um, um, 2006 and uh, that was uh, basically six months before the iphone got introduced and then of course everybody who saw it um you know because it had multi-touch and you know most of those elements said this is like the iphone and i was very upset but uh, because <laughs> but i mean the cool thing is that everybody intuitively you know just knew how to use it and uh, nurses and uh, technicians and everybody who would walk up to the system just needed no explanation. 
And that was really part of the success where now the devices in um, thousands of uh, operating rooms. And uh, this is, uh, you know, just uh, an example. I'm sure that also, you know, Apple probably took the idea from a minority report. And, uh, you know, although this, I still believe is uh, um, a very cool device that I typically love uh, demoing to, to customers. I still do a lot of uh, customer demos myself because I think you shouldn't buy software from very a company important. where the CEO can't even give a decent demo, you know, himself I, or herself. Uh, Stefan, I, you have no idea how much I, I agree with this, with that philosophy. Please, yeah, continue. I agree completely. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. So, you know, while we have this really cool product, we're also basically in the process of uh, basically just uh, a little bit uh, blowing up that market, you know, as well. You know, we, we created something we call Buzz Virtual because um, and this, this is your physical... digital. That's your digital OR vision, correct? Exactly. So that's like, you know, part of it, so to speak. But the digital OR vision is, uh, you know, a little bit. Um, those big screens um, basically are expensive. You know, they cost plus minus, uh, you know, 70 to 80 um, thousand dollars. And uh, basically with software, maybe a bit more. And uh, a lot of times the sales cycles are five years because, you know, you need to, you need to wait till they have some architectural project and engineering and uh, approvals and, you know, take the um, OR down to get it installed, etc. So, you know, waiting five years for me is a little bit like watching paint dry. So um, I'm just way too impatient. So I say, this is just not working for me. We need something else. And uh, so we came up with uh, you now what we call Bus Virtual. But when we developed it, it had the code name Brain Lab TV. Because a little bit like Apple TV, it's a small mm. box that basically you can plug into the video chain. In fact, you can hijack any existing screen in any OR. I, I, played, just... I played with the product actually at, at, oh, at cool. your booth. It was very cool. Yeah, it was, it was very, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, I'll remember the, the product manager's name, but yeah, it was a great demo. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Please, yeah. Yeah, so we can plug that in. And so we can basically stream and record and send that video signal somewhere else but also we can have any software running on a server that we now can basically bring to the screen. So it could be a screen where the competitive product was just installed a month ago, or it could be a, you know, say a 10 year old uh, GE 9800C arm with you know, almost like a tube monitor. And we can still basically take over that screen and bring some additional overlays, some additional intelligence, some um, maybe AI based labeling of, uh, of anatomy, etc. you know, to this device. So we basically are really able to, uh, you know, go into existing legacy, um, infrastructure and, uh, you know, take that over. And so basically that was for me, you know, just something that now the sudden gives a much broader access to, uh, to what the market can do. 